Intel's chicken is plucked. Their net income is down 114%. Their margins have shrunk by half and their manufacturing capabilities are so out of date that they're paying their competitor, TSMC, to produce chips for them. And adding insult to injury, their new Sapphire Rapids lineup of server CPUs has finally limped to the finish line two months after AMD's incredibly powerful, not to mention cheaper, Epic Genoa counterpunch. With poor pricing and customer hostile hardware as a service features, it's starting to feel like we're watching a Goliath megacorporation crumbling in slow motion under the weight of its own hubris. So why then is Pulseway sponsoring us to tell you about a crappy product that you probably shouldn't buy? It's because they know that with a new server and workstation processor come many of the same old problems. And the RMM tools in both Pulseway's mobile and web apps are more than serviceable solutions. And despite the fact that these chips are as outdated as they are brand new, Intel has their sights set clearly on the future, an accelerated future. And as bad as things look at the moment, that future might be pretty bright. Good gravy, this thing is thick. Like it's not bigger than last gen, but look at the size of it. Like you could hurt a man with it. Maybe even kill him if you get the angle just right, you know? Sapphire Rapids, the code name for Intel's fourth generation of Xeon scalable CPUs is based on the same Golden Cove core architecture that can be found in the performance cores of their 12th gen desktop processors. Yes, you heard me. Last year's consumer chips. That's a yikes. But it does still mean a 15% IPC uplift over their previous generation Xeon, so that's good. And there's a lot more that's different. AMD was the first to bring chiplet CPUs to the world, processors that use multiple dies with a high-speed interconnect, or glue, as Intel derisively put it at the time. Ha <laughs> ha, how the turntables have turntabled. This generation's Xeons, then, will glue together up to four chiplets to reach core counts as high as 60. But the devil's in the details, and Intel's glue differs from AMD's in some key ways. While AMD sticks their compute and their caches together and then glues these core complexes to a separate chiplet that contains the memory controller and the I.O., Intel has opted to keep all memory and I.O. functions on die with the logic and cache. Then they take these near complete CPUs and wire them to each other using a fabric interconnect, which means that in some ways it really is more like just gluing multiple CPUs together, which is hilarious. But hey, at least they can glue them together in a lot of different ways. Intel has announced and supposedly released 52 SKUs of fourth generation Xeon scalable with more apparently coming. So it seems like part of their strategy then was to find every possible segment of the market and build a just right option for it. Inside it are two, well, one for now, but we'll put the second one in in a minute, two Intel Xeon Platinum 8468 processors, each with 48 cores, 96 threads, and a max turbo speed of 3.8 gigahertz. These chips are equipped with 105 megabytes of cache, have a 350 watt TDP, and come in at an eye-watering list price of $7,214 each. I promise we're gonna talk more about all of that, especially pricing, later. First, let's get this CPU installed. This is a bit of a new mechanism, one that I have not um, seen before. I'm gonna need some thermal compound first and foremost, because instead of installing the CPU in the socket and putting the heatsink on that, you actually install the CPU to the heatsink and put the whole thing on the socket. Wild, right? Okay, so um, paste. You need so much of it. We should call this... Oh, a bit got in the socket. That's probably fine. You need so much of this, they should call this CPU the paste eater. Also because it's been so successful so far. Okay, sorry. Uh, anywho, um, this thing is... This is keyed, so it only goes in one way. Oh my god, this is ridiculous. Seriously? This is what holds this in, this arm? Yeah. Thanks, I hate it. No, 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 no. This is what helps you get it out. So put, oh. you put it in Oh, this in. levers it out. Yeah. Okay, so you just stick this boy in here. Oh my God. Seriously, Intel, 
You have how many billions of dollars to spend on engineering, and this is the solution? This is exactly the kind of precision engineered jank that I would expect from Intel. And then when it's time to get it out, you use this little lever to pop it up. OK, we're not going to do that right now. Ridiculous. OK, we got a little bit of thermal compound in the socket, but um, it looks like it mostly fell between the pins, so hopefully this is going to work. For RAM, we have 512 gigs of 4,800 megatransfer per second DDR5, which sounds like a lot, but that is a fraction of the maximum that this server can handle, thanks to Intel's support for up to eight channels of DDR5 per CPU, and, unlike AMD's competitor, up to two DIMMs per channel. That puts the total memory support for this system with two CPUs in it at 12 terabytes. What the frack? Each CPU also brings 80 lanes of PCIe Gen 5 expansion to the table, up to five integrated hardware accelerators, assuming you pay Intel to unlock them, we'll definitely get to that later, and on their soon to be released Xeon Max series of CPUs, they're gluing up to 64 gigabytes of high bandwidth memory 2E directly on the package. This could end up giving AMD's 3D vCache technology a run for its money. Coming back to glue for a moment, this server may only have two sockets in it, but the highest tier of Sapphire Rapids chips can glue as many as eight of these chips together in a single server, meaning that you could have up to 960 threads of computation on a single board, absolutely dwarfing AMD Epic, which is expected to cap out at just two sockets and 512 threads per system, even on their upcoming Bergamo CPUs. That's a lot of cores to dole out to your virtual machines. Thankfully, you can easily manage and monitor all that stuff off-site with Pulseway's mobile app. It helps you track performance, and you can get notified if a VM is acting out of turn and snipe it from the comfort of wherever your phone is. Not only does Pulseway give you complete control over your servers and network computers from any mobile phone or tablet, but their web app is also great for IT management. If you need to run updates or have concerns about CPU temperatures, Pulseway has intuitive automation tools for Windows, Mac, and Linux. This means that you can approach monitoring across your entire environment without the need to micromanage every operation. Now, let's get this thing up and running, shall we? Maybe give Cinebench a go to get an idea of all core performance? I hope it actually turns on. We did not anticipate this. Uh, <laughs> dang it, Adam. Give her a one of these. Yeah, it's not there. It's, I, yeah. OK, well, hold on. Let's put the shrouds in before they start trying to blow away the computer. You have to have the touch. Uh, it's not turning on. We got blinking lights. Yeah, we got blinking up here. It's still not turning on. Holy sh That's it. That's the noise we want. <laughs> well, let's see if it actually boots. We did get it to turn on, but there's a memory training error, which means it's not seated properly. So all we can really do until we find out where our torque wrench is, because engineering has it, is kind of try to get these the same. Very clever packaging. This is apparently our torque screwdriver. Do you happen to have a T30 bit? OK, how do I? I don't know. <laughs> oh, you've never used it? No. <laughs> Damn I mean, it, Tynan. Well, sure, yeah. I mean, you've probably used more torque it screwdrivers than I have. Well, no, manual? Why would I use a manual? I've got people for that. OK. Inch, oh my god. Wow, that's fun. OK, so how many Newton meters? It's uh, 0 0.904. This is scary. This seems like too much. OK, then oh. go do less. The good news is, if we brick this thing, we've already benchmarked everything. So we'll just continue the video and pretend this didn't happen. Well, one thing we know for sure is that it's a bit of a finicky socket to install in. That's good for the dozens of you who will deal with this to know. The good news, as I mentioned before, is that we already tested all this stuff ahead of time, so wow, what a fast Cinebench render that we would have been looking at on this monitor. But wait, a challenger from Team Red approaches. That's right, we got another server, and this one is equipped with a single flagship AMD Epic 9654. But that's not fair, Linus, you might say. You can't put two CPUs up against one. I can, and I will. Two Intel 8468s costs $14,400. One Epic 9654 costs around $12,000. Same number of cores, better price, and on paper, 
they even hit similar all core frequencies. Shall we drag race them? Well, spoiler, we did it already. So, yes, AMD is faster. How about a blender render? Haha, -ha. yes, we did this already. And AMD is faster again. But, as interesting as those tests are, we should really be looking at workloads that are closer to what these server chips were actually built for, like managing databases or virtualization. Unfortunately for Intel, the story doesn't really get any rosier here. Postgres sees Intel get absolutely trounced by AMD. I mean, losing by that much in one of the most popular types of databases? That's a really bad sign. And what about Gromax, a molecular dynamic simulator? Well, here, Intel actually manages to pull out a win, so their high-performance compute dreams might not be totally crushed. Until you consider their margin of victory here compared to their margin of defeat in pretty much any other general compute task. Epic is just looking like the obvious choice here, unless you know for a fact that you're going to run one application and one only that happens to benefit from Intel's chip design. And for all the ruckus that Intel has made about efficiency improvements, they lose in every single one of our tests. And we understand that a dual socket system will use more power than a single socket system, so this isn't a one-to-one -one comparison. But here's the thing. If AMD only needs a single socket for 96 cores, well, what am I supposed to do? Hamstring it by saying, no, you must have more sockets? Of course not. And neither would any decent procurement officer who's evaluating this hardware for their needs. If you want a many-core server, Intel's Sapphire Rapids costs more to buy and costs more to run, and they have no one to blame but themselves. Today. But, as we said, Intel is laser-focused on the future, and that future is AI. So they put extra effort into implementing accelerators for AI inferencing and other common workloads directly onto the CPU. Now, if you're a consumer, the concept of a hardware accelerator might already be familiar. Unlike the general purpose cores on your chip, accelerators are hyper-efficient for specific workloads, but then essentially useless for anything else. Hardware video decoders, for example, are what makes it possible to watch YouTube for hours on end without your phone turning into a hot potato. But that is all they do, and they take up valuable die space. Intel clearly thought that was worthwhile, and the first big one they built in is AMX, which stands for Advanced Matrix Extensions. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, you can think of this one as kind of an evolution of AVX, or Advanced Vector Extensions. It is ideally going to provide a massive increase in the CPU's ability to perform AI inference, with Intel citing up to a 10 times improvement over AVX 512. I mean, to be clear, this is not going to replace dedicated accelerators like NVIDIA's T4 cards, but it's a lot better than nothing. So do they win out in a light AI workload then? That's a yes with a capital H-O-L-Y-S-H-I-T. AMX can perform AI tasks with double or triple the performance of AVX 512. That's fast. Almost as fast as you'll be in our new LTT tracksuit. In general, the lead over AMD is stark, even if this doesn't translate to gains in every AI workload. And it could prove to be more and more useful into the future as we see small AI tasks sneak their way into software that might run on a system like this, as opposed to a dedicated machine learning box that's stuffed full of GPUs. What do the rest of these accelerators do? Well, first, their data streaming accelerator should improve performance in tasks where data is constantly generated by hundreds, if not thousands, of sources, like logging the telemetry data of many different sensors that you might be monitoring after a scheduled remote patch that you initiated with Pulseway. The in-memory analytics accelerator moves important analytical calculations of databases away from the CPU cores. Then Intel's dynamic load balancer is supposed to help manage and distribute work across the many cores in your CPU. Finally, Quick Assist technology accelerates encryption and compression. The idea here is pretty sound, and you can think of it kind of like how Pulseway works. I know, I keep bringing Pulseway into it. They sponsored the video, what do you want? So with Pulseway, you could do everything manually, right? But it's slower and it's less efficient. So you can think of Pulseway as kind of like a hardware accelerator for your workspace. You spend some of your time using their intuitive automation workflow, then your repetitive tasks run on autopilot, allowing you to focus your brain power on important things, which improves productivity, 
or saves power, uh, whichever appeals to you more. The thing is though, while we would love to put all of these accelerators, little time savers, efficiency makers to the test, it's still early days and software support simply isn't there yet and it might never get there. It all depends on whether organizations end up making use of these accelerators. There is one feature though that Intel has ready at launch and it's got their shareholders a buzz even if nobody else is impressed. It's called Intel On Demand. And frankly, calling it a feature seems kind of generous. What it does is it allows customers to upgrade their CPUs by paying Intel to unlock the hardware accelerators that are already in the silicon on the chip, but are blocked through software. The most charitable possible take here is that this will allow enterprise customers to save a buck at the time of purchase and then upgrade their chips down the line to accelerate new workloads. No need to remove, replace, and reconfigure a brand new server, which can be a hassle, especially with how finicky these CPUs are. <laughs> you just unlock the features you need and you're on your way, massively reducing the time to value for customers. Well, that's great, right? Savings on initial purchases is a good thing. Well, kind of. Except that at risk of painting their entire 52 SKU lineup with a broad brush, Sapphire Rapids is a pretty bad deal up front. And that's even before you pay Intel's ransom for unlocking the hardware they already sold you. I mean, I'm not sure how it happened, but Intel managed to price their top end chip 50% higher than AMD's, which as we've already discussed, kind of dunks on it. So then how is it that Intel still has so much of the enterprise market? And why aren't more customers crossing the line over to AMD? Well, it's a combination of factors. First up is long-term deals. Many of these Sapphire Rapid CPUs were purchased long ago, and customers have just been waiting through the delays for them to finally be delivered. Intel also has both the manufacturing capacity and the engineering staff to support the kinds of customers who buy chips in the hundreds or the thousands or even the tens of thousands, rather than one by one like you or I might do. Over the next couple of years though, it's clear that AMD is going to continue to consume Intel's valuable data center market share, especially in servers that rely on general purpose, high core count CPUs. For specific workloads that can take advantage of Intel's accelerators though, AMD has a lot of work to do and it's going to take some time, but that's okay. They've clearly got it. And as bad as Intel's quarterly results and forecasts look, so do they. I mean, turning a ship as big as Intel takes years and they have plenty of cash on hand to navigate this rough patch. I mean, look at AMD. Many were skeptical that they would ever be able to turn it around after their embarrassing bulldozer line of CPUs. But a CEO swap and five or six years later, the company was fully revitalized as they began launching product after product that made Intel shake in their boots. Like, like what's happening now. Thanks again to Pulseway. When it comes to monitoring and management, these folks are great. So if you're an MSP or you just wanna be able to keep tabs on your system while you're out at dinner, Pulseway has your back. They're hooking up LTT viewers with a no risk free trial. So check them out at the link in the video description. Thanks to AMD for getting Intel to actually start competing again. And thanks to Pulseway for sponsoring this video. Right now, they're hooking up our viewers with a free trial. So if you wanna use Pulseway to manage your devices like we do, check them out in the video description.